China is invading America, and they're doing it with money, and making Wall Street love them for it. Welcome to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. The Chinese Communist Party has spent years infiltrating liberal democracies around the world, and one reason they've been so successful is their use of elite capture. That is, targeting influential people to bring over to their side. One of their main targets for elite capture is business leaders, and it's really worked out well so far. So how does the Chinese Communist Party influence Wall Street? Joining me today is Professor Clive Hamilton, the co-author of the new book Hidden Hand, exposing how the Chinese Communist Party is reshaping the world. Clive, it's great having you on the show again. Good to see you, Chris. So the Trump administration has used some harsh language to describe Wall Street's relationship with China. Trade advisor Peter Navarro called them globalist billionaires and unregistered foreign agents. Do you think that's too extreme? Well, it's certainly strong language, uh, but uh, as we detail in our book, uh, Wall Street uh, globalist billionaires or top executives have um, developed close relationships with top Communist Party leaders over many years. And so when uh, senior Communist Party leaders uh, arrive in the United States, for example, to undertake trade negotiations, the first thing they do is uh, meet with these top globalist billionaires from Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and BlackRock and so on. And it's almost as if uh, they are uh, getting um, a, a steer on what the politics are uh, in the United States, um, understanding what Wall Street wants, and in effect acting in, in cahoots in a way that helps uh, the Chinese leaders when they're in the United States. And so I think uh, that's what Navarro was particularly enraged about during the early months of the negotiations between the United States and China over trade, which led to the trade war, uh, China's senior negotiator, uh, Liu He, would arrive in the United States and the first thing he would do would be to go to meet the, these top Wall Street executives. I mean, it's quite uh, bizarre. And so uh, when we look at the history of this going back 20 or so years, we see that uh, whenever a United States president uh, from George uh, w through Clinton to um, Obama has attempted to do some kind of pushback against China's cheating on uh, trade or investment. Uh, Wall Street mobilizes its forces and persuades the president or the advisors that, or indeed Congress, that this would really not be a good idea. So I think it's true to say that uh, Wall Street executives have been the Chinese Communist Party's most powerful allies in the United States. Well, in your book, you talk about how the Chinese Communist Party has targeted Wall Street. How do they do it? Is it just about inviting U.S. companies to do business in China, or is there more to it? Well, in the book, we talk about the way in which uh, in each country, the representatives of China and uh, whoever they're liaising with back in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, or close, closer to the Politburo, they identify where the power lies. Um, you know, where are the centres of power in each nation? And they zero in on those centres of power to exercise influence. And so it depends on uh, what kind of people they are and what they want as to how you go about influencing them. Now, you don't have to think very hard uh, to work out what Wall Street bankers and financiers want. Uh, and so the promise of uh, joint ventures, of uh, facilitating uh, Chinese investments in America or American investments in China, or playing a role in China's still very much restricted capital markets, you know, is like, um, you know, offering uh, Pooh Bear a pot of honey, if I can put it that way. Uh, it's absolutely irresistible, and now these Wall Street firms will do anything um, uh, to do it. And if um, uh, politics in the United States are providing some kind of obstacle 
uh, then they will do their best to overcome it. Yes, yeah, so yes, the promise of uh, lucrative rewards, massive rewards, uh, has been has really shaped the thinking of Wall Street uh, over the last 20 years. They want to get access to that imagined or real Chinese El Dorado and they'll do anything they can to do it. But it goes beyond that. One of the things we found particularly uh, fascinating was, uh, first of all, the uh, network of very good friendships between top Wall Street executives and top cadres of the Chinese Communist Party. And the other is the way in the willingness of uh, top Wall Street firms and top bankers and finance firms to employ the sons and daughters of top leaders in China. This turns out to be a systematic program of essentially uh, paying bribes, uh, which is what the Securities and Exchange Commission called it when they investigated. And so JP Morgan, for example, uh, has ex exactly that. It had a program called their Sons and Daughters Program, where they went uh, out of their way to attract and pay very lucrative uh, salaries to the sons, uh, daughters, and occasionally ne nieces and nephews of top uh, Communist Party leaders, irrespective of their capabilities, because they believed, quite rightly, that this was an in instant uh, Guangxi network and that by employing a son or a daughter, they would get access to deals in China. And that's exactly what has been happening. So it's not because they're really capable, hardworking individuals? There are some great examples. Uh, there's uh, one uh, uh, a daughter of uh, a, a top uh, Communist Party official who was hired by a uh, you know, Wall Street finance outfit uh, who was uh, extremely uh, incompetent, uh, very, very rude, did not turn up to the office very often. And when she did, uh, she sometimes brought her mother. And so she was basically a, a huge pain in the backside. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, she had the great advantage of giving the bank access to deals in China. And so they gave her a raise um, and she went on to various other well, very lucrative positions at other Wall Street uh, finance outfits. So basically, Wall Street gets really entangled with the Chinese Communist Party. So how has Wall Street used its influence to affect U.S.-China policy? Well, one way is by mounting uh, campaigns to pressure uh, presidents, Congress, uh, senior officials uh, to be nice to Beijing, and we've seen them do that for many years. Um, another way is uh, the kind of um, uh, revolving door of top uh, Wall Street executives moving into very, very senior positions within the White House where they can uh, exercise their influence while maintaining their networks with top Communist Party leaders. And in particular, um, administrations, both Democratic and Republican, have this kind of, are kind of mesmerised by Goldman Sachs. Uh, they, they feel that uh, an administration is not complete unless there's at least one uh, go top Goldman Sachs um, executive running Treasury or Chief of Staff or some extremely influential position, along with a, a, a series of uh, appointments to lesser but nevertheless very influential positions. And so Goldman Sachs, I think, um, and this is what we conclude in the book, has been uh, perhaps the CCP's single most important asset over the years in advancing a, a CCP point of view and pressing uh, the Communist Party's uh, position uh, within Washington. Now, I've never known the Communist Party to stab its own allies in the back, but do you think someday they might turn on Wall Street? Well, was it uh, Lenin who said the capitalists will sell us the, uh, the rope with which we will hang them? I think it was, um, perhaps one of those apocryphal quotations. Um, so yes, I mean, uh, Beijing wants uh, China to be the dominant global power. And that means eventually displacing the dollar with the renminbi and making Shanghai 
the global financial capital, uh, displacing Wall Street and the City of London. That's their uh, long-term objective and uh, they will pursue it um, ruthlessly if needs be and if that means uh, sending their Wall Street friends broke, <clears throat> so be it, more likely that their Wall Street friends would go and work in Shanghai instead. But yeah, that's their <clears throat> ultimate objective. It's a long way off, but they're certainly making significant early strides in the internationalisation of the renminbi, putting pressure on nations and international uh, financial institutions um, and organisations um, to uh, uh, to internationalise the renminbi. In other words, make it a currency that is uh, normal for normally used in international trade. Well. The U.S. government's China policy has changed a lot under the Trump administration. How has Wall Street taken it? Well, they're very unhappy. Um, what um, clever lobbyists do when they realize they have kind of lost uh, the battle is they attempt to shape the way the, the, the battle then is subsequently fought. And that's uh, what Wall Street has been doing. But the problem is, as you suggest, Chris, the, the landscape, the political landscape in the United States has changed uh, very substantially, as obviously. Um, and one of the reasons it changed, in fact, arguably the major reason it changed, is that US manufacturers, the other big chunk of the United States uh, economy, uh, decided in 2017 that they'd simply had enough. They'd run out of patience waiting for Beijing to honour its promises to liberalise its markets and to stop stealing uh, American technology. And so they wrote a report where they said, we've had enough, we don't believe that they're going to uh, liberalise in the way they promised, and so we in the United States need to take a firmer stand. Now, what was interesting is that the manufacturers distance themselves politically from the financiers in Wall Street. And it was that conflict at, uh, among the you know, captains of industry and the, uh, and, and the masters of finance that uh, opened up a political gap for the Trump administration uh, to launch its trade war uh, against China. So Wall Street is temporarily on the outer but uh, their power is undiminished, uh, so they'll be back. Well, all right, it's, it's election season here in the U.S., and so how much sway do you think Wall Street has on Trump and Biden? Well, they have, a, they have a, a, an ace up their sleeve, of course, uh, with Trump, and that is um, Donald Trump uh, watches the polls very closely, but not as closely as he watches the stock market index. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange is the uh, measure for Trump of his success as a president. And so that's a very powerful uh, weapon that Wall Street has, not that they can go out and manipulate it for political reasons, at least not as far as we know. Um, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, um, so uh, Wall Street still has uh, substantial interest, and there are powerful Wall Street um, figures or people who originated in Wall Street and will go back to Wall Street when Trump loses, um, who carry a great deal of sway in the administration. The China doves in the Trump administration are mostly connected uh, tightly with Wall Street. Joe Biden um, is a bit hard to read. Uh, I, th I think it's often the case in a situation like this when you're trying to assess what a president, uh, uh, a, a wannabe president would be like, would be to look at the people around him, the people who are giving him advice, shaping his view of the world. Biden has shown quite clearly an extremely soft position on China in the past. And he's often boasted about how well he knows Xi Jinping and how many great friends he's got in the top leadership, and so on. Uh, my sense is, and I hope I'm not wrong here, my sense is that he's shifted substantially this year and takes uh, a much less sympathetic position towards uh, Beijing. The people around him are a mixed bunch. Some are, uh, are keen to push back and to carry on broadly with the Trump 
resistance, if we can put it that way, whereas others still operate under the old settlement, uh, the old view that, well, if we're nice to China and encourage them into the global economy, then suddenly they'll discover how wonderful liberal values are. Mad view, you know, totally contrary to the, all of the evidence. But there are people schooled in that uh, whose careers have been based on that, and they too uh, find themselves within Biden's inner circle. Well, from a broader perspective, I imagine this isn't just a Wall Street issue. Is the Chinese Communist Party doing the same thing to other financial hubs around the world? Uh, certainly. Uh, Beijing has targeted all of the major financial hubs, uh, in addition to Wall Street, in particular Frankfurt and, of course, uh, the City of London. And um, they've done it in somewhat different ways. I mean, they, the, the, the big financial institutions um, in Europe have also uh, been engaged in sons and daughters programs. Uh, but in the City of London, uh, which we talk about at some length in the book, because the City of London in Britain is even more powerful, relatively speaking, uh, within the United Kingdom than Wall Street is in uh, the United States. It's basically because uh, while the United States still has a lot of manufacturing industry, Britain has very little. <clears throat> and that means finance uh, becomes uh, even more important. So Beijing has been uh, undertaking a really quite subtle influence program within the city of London, making friends amongst the powerful people there including the Lord Mayor. Remember, the City of London is that golden square mile within London, uh, which is the financial hub. And the Lord Mayor of that square mile um, is a very influential figure. And he's been won over. Uh, he now thinks the future of the City of London lies in China. And so they want to turn uh, this, uh, the City of London into the uh, global financial hub for the renminbi. And there already considerable progress has been made uh, along those lines. And as one sign of the politics of this, last year, well, let me say, each year the Lord Mayor has an annual parade. It's going back a long time. It's a very famous event. In fact, I was a boy in, in, in London when I was about eight or nine, and I remember watching the Lord Mayor's parade. Um, and it's a very kind of colourful and... Uh, be a calendar event and the Taiwan office, the Taiwanese embassy in London, has uh, typically had a, a float uh, in this uh, parade. But last year, the Taiwan office, office's float was banned. Clearly, they'd come under pressure from the Chinese embassy in London. Nothing to do with Taiwan, thanks very much. And so they just chopped it out. So you can see the way in which uh, Beijing's political influence uh, within uh, the city of London has been exerted in that. That's kind of a small but significant instance. You just imagine how the sh minds and the understanding of all those top financiers in the city of London have been shaped by their constant trips back and forward to uh, Shanghai and Beijing and how that influences the kind of pressure and stories that they tell to the government in Britain. I think it's very, very significant and a story that uh, I think probably still needs to be told in full. So what can countries do about this? Well, the first thing is to shine light on it and to understand uh, what is happening because the Chinese Communist Party loves to operate in the shadows and so um, shining a light on it uh, exposes it and makes life uh, more difficult for them but more particularly, it makes life more difficult for their allies. Because so when um, executives from the City of London or Wall Street or, you know, Number 10 Downing Street or in the White House saying, uh, Prime Minister or President, Mr. President, we, uh, really, we really should be much uh, more sympathetic to Beijing's concerns. After all, ABC, and it's in our interest to do it because of DEF, it's, it, it, then it becomes easier to understand where these people are coming from uh, that they've been groomed and captured and they are, in effect, acting as spokespersons for the Chinese Communist Party in their capital cities. Well, Clive, thanks again for joining us today. It's always, you're doing some great work. It's a pleasure. Uh, let's hope together we can shine that light. I'd like that.
Thank you, Clive. The book is called Hidden Hand, Exposing How the Chinese Communist Party is Reshaping the World. I highly recommend it. I'm putting a link in the description below. You can also find it at bookstores in the U.S. Yeah, there are still physical bookstores in the U.S. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.